100 years ago, two major innovations launched, one in Detroit and one in Rome. In Detroit, Henry Ford began to revolutionize the automotive industry with modern assembly technology. In Rome, Maria Montessori started the first modern kindergarten, the Casa dei Bambini, the first true educational institution for preschool, ch preschool children beyond the, the personal tutors for the wealthy. Uh, excellencies, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, dear Ashoka Fellows, Henry Ford is a business entrepreneur, Maria Montessori is a social entrepreneur. Both ideas have revolutionized their fields and they've become a new standard. Today, 50 million cars are produced every year and the assembly line has multiplied the productivity of many industries around the world. Within the same time, Maria Montessori's insight that every small child needs specialized education has really created a whole field. It is widespread, not only across the kindergartens that bear her name. Without it, our whole system of early childhood education would hardly be conceivable. She pioneered a new social idea against resistance and conventions, and she has systematically worked to establish this new idea in the market, in our minds and in our cities. She was an educational pioneer. She was a toy inventor, not sure you knew that. The founder of an organization, an international researcher and activist. Now, both innovations have changed our world, yet there is a key difference between them. Business innovations are supported by the market because there's a prospect of profit. In hindsight, each of us here would probably have loved to be among the first few investors in Henry Ford in 1911. If you had invested one dollar at that time, that dollar would now be worth $313,678. That's not bad. Maria Montessori did not operate in the framework of a market with profits that would have attracted investors. Nevertheless, she could return, offer a return of a different sort. Many of us here today would probably have loved to give her that one dollar a hundred years ago. In hindsight, it sounds easy. But the question I'd like us to think about at the beginning of these remarkable one and a half days is this. Which starting conditions do we give the groundbreaking ideas that are launching around us today, right here in Oslo, Norway, in Scandinavia, to solve the problems that our societies face. Not halfway around the world, but right here. The challenges of immigration and integration, of energy and the environment, of economic opportunity, free speech, and the education and the skills our children will need for their lives. Leading social entrepreneurs. They exist in every society, and some may be with us today. They actually are, I know. Met some of them already. Um, and if we haven't recognized some of the leading social entrepreneurs around us yet, it may be because the biggest barrier for social entrepreneurs in our societies isn't really funding or money. It's objections and skepticisms that occur every day and that we all know. And I'll just mention a few that we all instantly recognize. How often have you heard, oh, that's just the way it is? Or, surely that must be someone else's problem. Or, it may not work. This, this could fail. Or, this is my favorite. The old days were better anyway. By the way, children don't have any of these objections. It seems to be an acquired, an acquired taste. Social entrepreneurs overcome these objections. Their personalities, ideas, and action tell stories of how people can affect large-scale change because that's really the only thing that ever has. Still, countless ideas, countless great ideas fail or they fail to grow because of these powerful uh, obstacles and barriers to our imagination. What if, what if we could find leading social entrepreneurs at the stage when they have proven their ideas 
and are on the brink of remaining local or growing their idea to change a whole field like Maria Montessori has? What if we could liberate them with smart financial support and help them focus fully on their idea? What if we could connect them to a network of world-class entrepreneurial minds and professional resources? What if, if we could do this as a society, the result would be a tremendous lever for change? And that is really the central insight that has launched Ashoka 30 years ago and that has since created an entire field. It has led us to identify 2,800 leading social entrepreneurs in 72 countries up to today. Here in Norway, Hanne Finstad inspires children for science and builds a movement around experiential learning. A whole core of dedicated teachers in the Forska Fabriken that change how science is taught and perceived across the country. Also from Norway, Johan Koss, who some of you may know as an Olympic medalist, has discovered how sports and play can help children and youth break out of the cycle of poverty, disease, and conflict all over the world. With over 500 staff, his organization Right to Play now reaches young people in more than 20 countries. Looking beyond Norway to another Scandinavian country, Torkil Sonne from Denmark has a son with autism. He realized that people with autism are very good at diligent, detailed, repetitive tasks. So he started a business in software testing and data entry on that insight, transforming a handicap into a competitive advantage. He wants to create a million jobs for these extraordinary specialists. And looking outside of Europe to a solution that has been invented elsewhere, but that is making its way over to Ireland, Germany, and Scandinavia soon, Mary Gordon of Canada invites mothers to bring their babies into classrooms. She allows kids to witness the cries, the smiles, and the development of these tiny human beings, understanding the roots of empathy and transforming their emotional development. One more. There are innovations that have already conquered the world. Jeru Moria from India has started a toll-free hotline for street children run by street children that has grown to over 120 countries in 10 years. She has then launched a movement that empowers kids to take care of their own finances, spreading financial literacy to young people. In fact, the day before yesterday, I met her in Amsterdam, and she had just reached her goal of reaching one million kids in 75 countries to take care of their own finances. There are 2,800 stories like these, and there's probably not enough time to tell them. But think of them as a portfolio of solutions that can be shared and replicated all over the world, no longer requiring us from reinventing the wheel all the time over in the social sector. Three of the fellows I've just mentioned are part of the Ashoka Globalizer program, which brings together ideas that are ready to go global with the strategies and the support and the networks they need. It happens actually this weekend in Stockholm again. Um, so you're most welcome to read about, you know, you can probably read about it in the papers. Not every Ashoka fellow will go global like Jerubi Limoria has, but we work with fellows everywhere in the world to find the smartest and the fastest way for their ideas <coughs> to grow to the next level. 2,800 Ashoka fellows, think of them like a radar for social change, for impending shifts in our societies, for new marketplaces, for business models. Wherever new populations become full economic citizens, wherever disadvantaged groups are empowered to play a new role, wherever a society transforms itself to a new level, they play a key role. They push the envelope on what is possible. They start with a crazy idea and establish a new standard. For a business entrepreneur, and I know there are some among us today, watching this process, watching them being connected to them, is like a predictor of new markets. Let me give you an example for that. A few years, Nike, the sportswear company, came to us and they told us their fastest growing business is women's sport clothes. Now, in many of the fastest growing con economies, women uh, have powerful barriers 
are facing powerful barriers to sports. So there's a social problem in the way to realizing a market. So we connected Nike with all the social entrepreneurs around the world who w use sports to create social change. Today, a few years later, Nike has given millions to them and has de redefined its corporate mission as sports for social change. 2,800 Ashoka Fellows, think of them as a collaborative force collaborative entrepreneurs who work together, who can build on each other to solve not only individual problems, but build joint ventures, change whole industries. They are, you could say, the biggest recruitment agency for more social entrepreneurs. A social entrepreneur will involve thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes millions of people directly in change. And the media will tell the stories to millions more who will have a role model and empowerment for their own ideas. Imagine what happens as the network of Ashoka Fellows grows in a country, creating critical mass and tipping a whole field towards a new standard of active change-making. When we launched Ashoka a few years ago in my home country, in Germany, the question we were faced with was, do we need social entrepreneurs in a rich welfare state? Is solving social problems not really the job of government? Now, you wouldn't be here if you did believe that, but money cannot buy great ideas, and government cannot replace entrepreneurs and innovators. 270 Ashoka Fellows in Europe prove that social entrepreneurs are important beyond the developing and the emerging markets, that they are not different in how they, uh, in how they work and what is at the essence of their being. Creativity is universal, Dedication is universal. Ethical integrity is universal. Social entrepreneurs all over the world are very similar in how they find new resources to solve a social problem. Often, they engage their target group as co-creators rather than treat them as beneficiaries or recipients of a service. In that way, social entrepreneurs pioneer a society in which everyone is a change maker an emotionally competent problem solver in the face of accelerating change. Yet, social entrepreneurship is also, and will also need to be, somewhat different in Europe and in the Nordic countries compared to, any, uh, to elsewhere in the world. When most people think of social entrepreneurs, they think of the archetype that the field has created. And Scott has just invoked Muhammad Yunus, the powerful founder person of a local economic development innovation that lifts people out of poverty in a developing country or an emerging market. Put yourself into his shoes. In his world, there is no alternative to entrepreneurship and to self-financing models if you want to grow a solution. And the growth of that solution is uninhibited by competition from government, centuries-old welfare organizations, churches, associations, and foundations. Our European world is different. We have the blessings of comprehensive education and health systems, of state welfare and pensions, and a social entrepreneur will rarely be completely alone in a field. They may often be deeply embedded in structures. They may have found it smart to work with government instead of charging their beneficiaries, or to work through existing welfare organizations instead of growing a large organization themselves or give away their idea for free to partners instead of invoking competition. So social entrepreneurship will be and will need to be different in Europe and will need to find ways to empower social entrepreneurs because we are at a key moment. We are at a key moment in Europe because we see fast growing media attention, support organizations flourishing, social venture funds starting, university courses springing up, and graduates looking